Is there any, like, anywhere that in might In this again? particular chapter? Not so much, right? Um, no, not really. Okay. No, his sense of smell doesn't really come into play. In this one, yeah. In, in that story. Um, I feel like Roaches does more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sweet baby Roach. <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair, a Global Witcher podcast. My name is Alyssa from Good Morin, and I'll be your host as you, I, and our international Hansa accompany Geralt of Rivia and his destiny, Cyrilla of Sintra, across the continent. Before we get started, it brings me so much joy to introduce you to four legendary members of our Hansa, Jameson, Olaf of Silesia, Bruno Arcelino, and Alex Berner, who have become the founding patrons of the show. This is absolutely mind-blowing to me. (laughs) Although the Patreon page was created with the other social media accounts before the podcast trailer aired, I wasn't expecting to mention it in an episode for a very long time, and I certainly wasn't expecting anyone to really find it. (laughs) But, ugh, I I can't with you all. (laughs) I'm never going to forget this, but the very first email from Patreon came through two hours after the trailer aired. I was at work, I was eating lunch, and I flipped over my phone and there was this push notification from Patreon saying that we received our first Patreon. Guys, <laughs> I full on choked at my desk for I think like two to three minutes, just coughing and coughing and coughing. <laughs> so thank you, Jameson, for being the very first patron of Breakfast in Beauclair and nearly killing me in the process. <laughs> Jameson was shortly followed by Olaf of Silesia, Bruno Arcelino, and Alex Berner, who is my fellow Crimson Pelican. Hey! <laughs> I want to personally thank our founding four for going so far off the path to show their support for the show. Each episode, I'll introduce any new patrons of the show to you, our international Hansa. If you'd like to join these founding four in an everlasting spot on the Hansa wall of our website, head on over to patreon.com slash breakfast in Beauclair. As for this episode, Charlotte Wengerberg Glamry joins us from North Carolina to discuss the second short story in Andrew Sikowski's The Last Wish, A Grain of Truth. Together, we'll explore themes such as Legends of Blue Roses and Brooks's, Justice and Fantasy, and What's the Day-to-Day of a Beast Vampire Relationship? During the break, Lars Mutterflix joins us to discuss cast, crew, and post-production updates from the Netflix series. And when we return, Charlotte and I go behind the scenes of her shop, Wengerberg Glamry, to learn how she creates her beautiful, lore-accurate Witcher fragrances. As part of the Breakfast in Beauclair International Hansa, receive an exclusive discount on your next purchase of Glamry. Use code HANSA for 10% off your purchase of Wengerberg Glamry through the end of September 2019. Visit Glamry.com or find Wengerberg Glamry on Etsy to make your purchase. Without further ado, let's get to this episode's short story, A Grain of Truth. Hey everyone, welcome to the episode. My name is Alyssa from Good Morn, and I'm so excited to have Charlotte from Vengerberg Glamorai joining me from North Carolina. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, so you and I actually got to know each other through Instagram, like right when I first started my account you have your own shop dedicated to lore accurate fragrances and i'm really excited to have you on today to talk about one of the short stories a grain of truth as well as about your business venture yeah i'm really excited (laughs) so just to give the audience a little bit of background can you tell us a little bit about your early experiences with the witcher universe yeah absolutely So I first was exposed to the Witcher story and the Witcher world um, through the video games, mainly just the Witcher 3. (laughs) But my partner, you know, was really excited about the Witcher series. He got the Witcher 3 for PC. I basically spent an entire uh, summer just watching him play it. (laughs) I was so engrossed in the story of this video game and also just how stunning the game was. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd never seen a game that beautiful in my life. Um, And I'm kind of, I'm really picky about video games. Uh They have to be gorgeous. They have to have a good story. And they have to engage me, you know, for a long period of time. And The Witcher pretty much checked all of those boxes off. So I was like a, I was a backseat gamer. I was an (laughs) over-the-shoulder gamer. 
until finally I was just like, give me the controller. <laughs> like, it's my turn. I want to play this game. You sit behind me. You watch me play it. I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I was obsessed. I'm one of those people that likes to get 100% on video games. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't do that. I can't get 100% on The Witcher. There's just <laughs> too much to do. If you don't follow certain storylines, you don't get to do these things. Mm -hmm. So you can just play it like for an infinite amount of time. And just it's a different game every time. So the game was the first introduction. After I played the game, I still wanted more. Uh, so I got into the books actually started with the audiobooks um, oh, really? instead of the actual like paper books. Yeah. Audible has audiobooks of the Witcher series that are narrated by probably one of the best audiobook narrators I've ever heard. His name is Peter Kenny. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that some people have mixed opinions, I guess, about his reading. Uh -huh. um, but I think he's fucking brilliant. So I had like a two hour commute at the time. Oh, wow. And it, it made that commute so pleasant and so wonderful and so magical for me. Like, I just wanted to keep driving. I didn't want to get home or, like, get to work. I just wanted to keep listening to the books. Yeah. So first the games, then the audiobooks, then the books. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people that are very familiar with The Witcher now definitely walked into it through the video games. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people that are coming in through the Netflix show. I think it's going to be really fascinating to see um, kind of who comes in through the Netflix series and then if and how they're receptive toward the books and the original source material. But yeah, the way that you got into the Witch universe sounds exactly the same as how I did too. Yeah, pretty standard. <laughs> yeah, definitely backseat driving. I think, yeah, with me, I had to be talked into getting my own account and playthrough. <laughs> <laughs> I was super content with just watching. I was really sad when I had been playing on, you know, my ex-partner's account and I was super OP, and then I made a new account, and I was just getting mauled by, like, level five wolves. I was so, <laughs> so heartbroken. <laughs> As we've spoken about, you have your own business centered around perfumes and fragrances from The Witcher. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me a little bit about how smells and fragrances play a role in the storyline, and briefly how that's inspired um, your line of work? Yeah, Geralt, you know, as as I'm sure most of the audience will know, is a witcher. He's kind of a mutated human being. And as a result, his uh, senses are heightened. Most of the time in the book focuses around his sense of eyesight, because he's got these crazy cat eyes he can see in the dark, or his crazy fighting style, or his, you know, like, uh, witcher sense. Um, but he also has a really keen sense of smell as a result of, you know, going through the trial of the grasses and becoming a mutant. Sapkowski, in the books, really makes a point of illustrating this. Usually when Geralt is around a woman, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it, it comes into play at other points in the book, but for the most part, he emphasizes this very keen sense of smell around the ladies. <laughs> And so, you know, he comes across a lady, and he, like, walks up to the lady, and Sabkowski goes to great lengths to describe what he smells in addition to what he sees, you know, with this lady. So almost every love interest that Geralt, you know, gallivants around with in the books has a very distinct perfume. Yeah, for sure. Again, like, super bizarre to always hear um, male authors describe women. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just got to say, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Sebkowski does not disappoint in this regard. <laughs> he certainly falls right into that category. I mean, I love him. I love the books. Yeah. But, but he is a male author writing about women. <laughs> <laughs> so today, Charlotte and I are going to be discussing A Grain of Truth, which is the second short story in Andrew Sapkowski's Last Wish. Part one starts in a forest. Geralt in the middle of this forest comes across the corpses of a man and woman. After examining the corpses and contents of the man's belt, Geralt determines that they came from the forest on their way home from the town where a credit note and the belts came from. He questions out loud to his horse, Roach, why they weren't on the highway, and he makes the decision to investigate further. This is a pretty short bit, but it introduces kind of the setting and this mysterious tone of what might happen in the rest of this chapter. Yeah, uh, he definitely starts to implement some of his manhunting skills mm -hmm. in this like first tiny little scene. 
Yeah. He's uh, clearly a skilled tracker. Mm -hmm. And when he comes across some weird, morbid shit in the woods, I mean, what's a bored witcher to do? Exactly. You know? <laughs> hey, there's some uh, dead bodies over here. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go check it out. And the cool thing that you see here is, like you said, how he actually does as a tracker and as um, a witcher. And you really get to see him work. He rummages through these corpses and he comes across a credit note in the man's belt. I think this is like really clever, but he says that like no one carries a credit note for long. So he thinks about where the credit note came from and determines that they must have left that town recently. So they must have been on their way home from there. But why were they so far off the path? And that's when he's like, something's odd about this. He notices that the corpses are like super bloodied and messed up from some sort of monster. He's not sure what, but he can tell that the animals that kind of scavenged the bodies only found them after the bodies were dead. Yeah, he's a, he's a sharp one when it comes to dead bodies, that's for sure. But not any time else. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's interesting when, when he pulls out his, uh, his intelligence, that's for sure. It's definitely selective. <laughs> yes, very much so. But I adore him, so... <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh, Geraldo. <laughs> Part two, Geralt encounters a wall in the middle of the forest and spots a girl at a distance. Roach is uneasy. And when the witcher tries to talk to the girl, she runs down the hillside and disappears. He passes through the wall's gate and enters the overgrown courtyard of a rundown mansion. Suddenly, a beast charges out from the house toward him. Geralt pulls out his sword in a defensive move, and the beast lurches to a halt. The monster threatens Geralt, and the witcher calls him out in his bluff. The two trade banter before the monster invites the witcher into the manor. So this is one of my favorite scenes in this whole chapter. Mm. And I think that the banter here is really funny and really engaging and unexpected, really. <laughs> so you have Geralt walking into the seemingly abandoned grounds of like a home and he starts poking around and there's this beautiful blue rose bush in the middle. And as he's going to inspect the flowers, there's just this thing that comes out of the house and charges at him because he's a witcher and he's loaded with weapons, <laughs> um, pulls out his sword and then the beast just kind of stops. And then it starts talking in the common tongue, which is the language that most people speak um, in the Northern Kingdoms. <laughs> and it threatens him. And you get all of this like theatrics where the beast is just like, flee, mortal man. And then Geralt's kind of like, no. <laughs> He's like, make me. He's like, well, you what? Like, you and what army? Like <laughs> Exactly. Like, Geralt is not frightened of this creature at all, and the creature still threatens him. And then when Geralt really doesn't show any signs of, like, backing down or being terrified, he's just kind of like, oh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? I've, exactly. Yeah, most people scream and piss themselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I think that it just sets it up for a very funny and unexpected manner, especially because you have this monster. He keeps saying, like, oh, pox on it. And it's just very funny and very formal. I love this section. Yeah, I also think it's interesting for someone who, you know, in the beginning of the books and in the previous chapter is described as a monster hunter. He just, like, kills monsters for coin. Yeah. He doesn't immediately start flaying this thing alive. Mm -hmm. He pulls out his sword in a defensive move, and waits to see what will happen. Right. You know, luckily for him, the monster is not actually that intimidating. <laughs> no, and there's this excerpt from this chapter that I absolutely love because I just think it's so funny. Again, like, it kind of subverts your expectations about what you presume is a threatening monster. I guess to back up a second, the description itself is very funny. <laughs> this monster is described as humanoid, wearing tattered but well-made clothes with a bear-like head, enormous ears, wild eyes, crooked fangs set in terrifying jaws, and a red tongue flickering like flame. <laughs> and this is what Geralt encounters. And then when they actually get to talking, again, like they're speaking the same language, this monster is actually strangely formal as well. <laughs> but there's this really funny description where this is at the point where he realizes that Geralt isn't going to be scared of him. This excerpt from the book reads, The monster shifted from one foot to the other and scratched his ear. Listen, you, are you really not afraid of me? Geralt responds, should I be? The monster looked around, cleared his throat, and yanked up his baggy trousers. Fox <laughs> on it. What's the harm of a guest in the house? It's not every day I meet someone who doesn't run away or faint at the sight of me. 
It's so bizarre. <laughs> and I think it says a lot about Geralt's experiences in his world. This isn't out of his realm of like what might be normal or abnormal. Yeah, and I think due to his experience, he's able to determine at this point just by looking at something whether or not it's a real threat or if it's something that's been cursed. Mm -hmm. In the previous story, they set up this whole idea that he's definitely able to break curses that other people aren't capable of breaking due to his profession. Yes. He knows uh, somebody in a, in a bad situation when he sees one. <laughs> yeah. Although I might have just like given a, given some stuff away already. <laughs> but <laughs> We're going to get to the spoilers in a bit. So you have a note here about the indigo rose bush. Yeah. And about its symbolic importance outside of Sikofsky's work. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. When I was reading this story for the first time, I was actually really intrigued that Sapkowski decided to make the rosebush indigo or blue. I've actually seen blue roses referenced before in other fantasy stories. The first time I ever saw it was in this really old movie from the 1940s called The Thief of Baghdad. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's a trip. But if you have, you'll remember that there's a scene in there where a princess is given a blue rose and when she smells it, she forgets that's everything. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had this really clear image in my head of seeing this motif of a blue rose somewhere. So I did a little bit of digging about it. And um, it turns out that blue roses are kind of prevalent in fantasy stories, but they're more prevalent in fantasy stories from China. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So the myth and the legend of the blue rose is from China, as far as I'm aware. They symbolize unrequited or impossible love. Oh. Very, very, very difficult to get or just like fantastical, impossible love. And the legend of the Blue Rose, to summarize it, basically goes like this. There was a princess and she didn't want to get married. Her father wanted her to get married and she was a very headstrong princess. So basically she said, all right, I'll marry whoever brings me a blue rose. Mm -hmm. And at this point, no one had ever heard of such a thing. Such a thing did not exist. So various people tried to bring her what they thought she meant by a blue rose. Mm -hmm. Someone brought her a blue rose made out of sapphires and gold. Someone brought her a blue rose painted on porcelain. Um, someone tinted the window in the palace blue and you know brought her a white one <laughs> so that when the light shined through it looked blue and she turned every single one down ultimately she falls in love with someone that she's not supposed to marry mm -hmm. you know someone who's like a pauper and she's talking to the pauper about her predicament told my father I need a blue rose now he's got all these guys bringing me all this stuff and <laughs> I don't know what to do so the pauper is like it, it doesn't really matter what color rose they bring you like when you know it's the right one you'll see it as blue Blue. So eventually, like, the pauper presents her with a rose, right? And it's a white rose. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the palace can see that it's a white rose. But she insists that it's blue. <laughs> so she ends up marrying this pauper. And that's the story of the blue rose. That's so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but I thought it was fascinating that he decided to make the forbidden rose bush indigo. Because it does symbolize an impossible, really fantastical relationship. Yeah, which is definitely par for the course when it comes to this story. The the idea of fantasy and the idea of fairy tale is something that, as we'll see, each of the characters actually talks about the impossibility of fairy tales. Mm -hmm. um, so this is absolutely perfect, and thank you so much for bringing that into the conversation. Yeah. So the monster leads Geralt to a dining room in the house, which lights and fills itself with food at his command. Sat at the table with the feast, the monster introduces himself as Novellan. After some coaxing from Geralt, Novellan tells the Witcher his story. Years ago, Novellan became the young head of his family's gang. One day, the gang pillaged a temple and raped the priestess there. She cursed Novellan before killing herself, and a few days later, he had been transformed from a boy into a monster. The gang and servants fled, some were killed, and no one returned, leaving him alone for months. So this is the first time that we're really hearing about the details of what happened to this monster, Novellan. Like you had said, clearly Geralt knows that this isn't something that's necessarily threatening, that this monster isn't necessarily something that's malicious. So he takes the time to actually dig into who this monster is. It's this really incredible part of the story because it wraps the reader up in like the tension that this room has. You have at this table a monster and a monster hunter, or at least a person who believes he's a monster mm. and a monster hunter. And they don't really know how each of them got there. I think they're on some level a little bit confused, but also uncertain about what the other person's intentions and motives are. 
Yeah, definitely. Also, like when you when you learn about the backstory of Navellan, you know, he definitely becomes even more human than his like bumbling, you know, baggy pants self. <laughs> because uh, clearly, you know, he's done something wrong. Yeah. When I was reading through this story again, it was emphasized that Navellan was like forced into raping this priestess. Yes. By his friends or by his gang members or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that they were like, oh, you know, gotta become a man and yeah. and all this stuff. But like, he still did it. Right. He still did it. I don't care if he was, you know, a milk sop or whatever he described himself <laughs> as. <laughs> Just like some some stupid boy. I don't know. I, I think that he knew it was wrong. Yeah. Because he definitely seems to feel remorse about it. Yeah, for sure. When he talks about his experiences with that gang, it seems that Novellan came from a family that operated in Palak Mafia would, mm -hmm. where he does say that his father had something to do with like the levees in the town, but that people also didn't like him and that his grandfather and father had both been robbers. His grandfather went a bit nuts in his old age and his father was chopped up and brought to him in like a cart, which is ugh, gross. Oh, geez. <laughs> so this is how Novellan becomes the head of this gang. So he's young and experienced, a pushover and a milksop, as you quoted. <laughs> <laughs> which is probably an insult that I should use in the future. <laughs> yeah, and he kind of gets dragged along and peer pressured to an extent into this by older members of this gang. But you're right, like he does go along with it. I don't I don't know if he would have felt remorse or accountability for his actions had like this curse not happened either. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I don't think he would have really felt that bad about it had nothing happened afterwards. Yeah, I think he would have just kind of continued on that same milksop trajectory yep. for <laughs> forever. It's good to have consequences for your actions, you know, it puts things in perspective. <laughs> So aside from the actual story that Novellan tells Geralt, we have the opportunity to learn a lot more about witchers. For a reader reading The Last Wish for the first time, we get a little bit of excerpts from A Voice of Reason. In the last story, The Witcher, we get a little bit from King Foltest about like what witchers do. Velarad again, like gives the reader a little bit of insight, but it's not terribly thorough. So we get another little nugget about the backstory of witchers from Geralt's conversation with Novellan. Mm -hmm. So in this part, Novellan asks Geralt if he can see a portrait of his old self hung above the fireplace. And Geralt says yes, without really thinking. Novellan then asks Geralt who he is. And Geralt responds, I don't understand. Novellan says, you don't understand? My portrait is hung beyond the candlelight. I can see it, but I'm not human, at least not at the moment. A human looking at my portrait would get up, go closer, and no doubt have to take the candlestick with him. You didn't do that. So the conclusion is simple, but I'm asking you plainly, are you human? And Geralt responds, you know, if that's the way you put it, then not quite. It's clever to be able to see Novellan deduce Geralt's, you know, mutation just from this one simple act. I wonder how many times he's asked a guest that question, though. Do you think he ever has a reason to doubt? I don't know. That's the thing. It's, that's a really specific question to ask someone. Yeah. And also, like, a very specific set of parameters. It's like, you would have had to take a candlestick and go <laughs> get up and go closer. And I'm like, well, who did you last have in here that you were questioning whether or not they were human? That's... Hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, again, we're going to get to the details of Novellan's story, mm. but if you think about the kinds of people that he's had in his complex, yeah. they're, like, painfully normal, <laughs> <laughs> like, overly normal and very human. There's a very specific kind of person that finds themselves in Novellan's manor in the middle of the woods, and Geralt is not that kind of person and not that kind of pair of people. Mm-hmm. So he's alone. He says that he's lost. He's armored to the teeth. I'm not surprised that Novellan has some curiosity and skepticism about who this guest is in his home. Yep, definitely not surprising. Uh, if a guy like that just showed up at my front door, I'd probably be pretty wary too. Not if he was in a bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> And again, like the detail that we get about witchers here after Geralt admits that he's a witcher, Novellan says like, oh, I know what you are. Like, I've heard about them. Novellan says, I've heard about witchers. They abduct tiny children who they feed with magic herbs. The ones who survive become witchers themselves, sorcerers with inhuman powers. They're taught to kill and all the human feelings and reactions are trained out of them. They're turned into monsters in order to kill other monsters. 
And I think this invites curiosity from the reader. It fleshes out this person who we've met, but we still don't really know anything about who he is. Yeah, it's definitely just like some exposition, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about you. <laughs> Let me tell you all about you. <laughs> You definitely didn't know that apparently it's common knowledge within this world that witchers are abducted children that are drugged up mm -hmm. and become monsters. That's what everybody seems to think. Yeah. You get the overall tone of how the world sees Geralt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you think back to how Geralt was treated in the previous short story in The Witcher, it informs the reader as they move forward in the story and through the saga about the perception of witchers. And we do learn a lot more about it as the story continues. Novellan here isn't wrong, but it's definitely something that tonally has a lot of skeptical or negative undertones to it as he's uh, interviewing Geralt. Definitely. We learn from the Witcher that monsters have a sensitivity to silver. Geralt brings this information back in his conversation with Novellan. Novellan insists that he's a monster, and Geralt says that he's not because Novellan's able to touch the silver flatware, he's able to touch the silver medallion that Geralt has. This is where Geralt believes, you know, Novellan isn't as much of a threat as he might seem, and that's probably from a spell or a curse. And then this is where we, like, dig into the details of Novellan's story. Mm. We learn about his gang, we learn about his family history, and when it comes to how this curse was placed upon him, they overpowered the priestess and told Novellan that he had to become a man. While he was raping her, she yelled out something and then kills herself during the act, and then the whole gang got out of there. So what she said was that Novellan was a monster in human skin, that he'd be a monster in monster skin, and then something that Novellan can't remember about love and blood. Which, all of that came true. <laughs> And she killed herself afterward. Like, oh my god. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is commitment to, I don't know, retribution, revenge, punishment. Ugh, grizzly. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it was so bad that she had to kill herself afterwards, so that is just, that's rough. Yeah. I don't understand why. She should have just killed him. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, because she had a hidden dagger. That's how she killed herself. I mean, again, like, if there's a whole gang of people there, she probably wouldn't have been able to take out all of them. Mm -hmm. But still. Yeah, it's, yeah, they messed up big time. I mean, Novellan did something that someone committed suicide afterwards, so that's that's pretty bad. Right, <laughs> right. But it was revenge suicide, question mark? This is not useful for anybody. Like, this whole thing is just bad juju. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in this magical world, for all we know, that could have been how the curse is sealed. You know, I have no idea. <laughs> oh, in that, like, she killed herself? Yeah. Yeah, it could have had something to do with, like, making sure the curse was, was a good one or something. <laughs> yeah, I assume that that's what it was. I assume that blood had something to do with starting it and then, spoilers, ending, ending it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we're going to get to. Yep. So a few days after this incident in the temple, Novellan awakes and finds himself transformed. So he goes on this rampage through the house. He kills some of the servants. Everyone flees from the complex and he's just left alone, sobbing over the bodies of some of his servants. <laughs> yeah, this ain't great. <laughs> he just goes on a rampage and has a massive tantrum and then kills people. Like, mm -hmm. If he was capable of speaking in the common tongue, as he clearly is, I feel like maybe he could have talked to somebody, but yeah. I guess everyone would have just freaked out. I mean, like, I understand, you know? Yeah. A guy with the head of a bear, that's pretty freaky. <laughs> I mean, talking to a friend about this, he wondered why, you know, Novellan just didn't take 10, chill out, and then just emerge after having <laughs> contemplated his life and his thoughts and just been like, hey, listen, this is weird. I'm aware, but I can control the house now. So you've got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm half of a bear now. It's okay, though. Everything can continue as normal. <laughs> and you don't have to do any of the cooking, any of the cleaning, because I got it with my magical curse. Uh, so you can just hang out we could be friends <laughs> and not what happened Novellan went on a rampage and then everybody ran yep eventually Novellan spots a trespasser on the grounds and jumped outside to confront him the stranger scared told Novellan the roses he was taking from the rose bush were for his daughter and Novellan remembering old fairy tales about romance breaking spells yells your daughter or your life oh my god <laughs> oh Novellan <laughs> 
The merchant confesses that his daughter is only eight. Novellan, feeling bad, invites the merchant in, giving him gold and precious stones on the way out. So word spreads amongst peasants about the wealthy beast in the woods, and Novellan hosts a number of girls who are arranged to stay with him for short periods of time before leaving with some of the family fortune. As the years pass, Novellan continues to grow confident in himself and is less concerned about returning to his former state. Mm. I thought it was funny that part where the merchant's just like, my daughter is eight. (laughs) (laughs) Like, what do you mean? (laughs) I can't imagine like panicking in the moment and like the few milliseconds it must have taken for him to be like, ah, daughter, ah, fairy tales, your daughter or your life. Like, wild. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely a common trope in fairy tales for sure. Yeah, at this point he's been alone. This is the first human interaction he's had in months. Mm -hmm. At this point in his life, presumably wants to break this curse. Yep, the kiss of a fair virgin maiden will break (laughs) your curse and solve all of your problems. (laughs) And he does think that. He does think that. So as these villagers, you know, keep bringing their daughters to this creature boar bear like thing just in the middle of the woods yeah it definitely comes out that novellan stops believing in like the power of women or the power of virgins or like Mm -hmm. he stops believing that um because none of it works yeah he's just so lonely he just continues to be a sugar daddy for a while (laughs) basically that's that is exactly (laughs) what he is oh yeah best sugar daddy ever apparently yeah, this is um, the whole arrangement of, you know, the, the daughter or your life thing. I mean, I, I'm sure most people that have read this story draw common lines between the story and Beauty and the Beast. Right. Because in that story, you know, oh, it's the love of a fair maiden or whatever that breaks the curse and the beast is no longer a beast. And Zabkowski, he does this a lot. He sort of does these little homages to famous fairy tales within the Witcher world. Mm -hmm. Um, He has a tendency to take well-known fairy tales and then just sort of like rewrite them in his own way into the Witcher universe. Exactly. And that's kind of what he did here. It's like a Beauty and the Beast premise. Um, He's done this with Rapunzel and Snow White and like other fairy tales throughout the series. But Mm -hmm. in the original Beauty and the Beast, the Beast sort of being a sugar daddy is all also a thing like he, <laughs> the, he sends people back with jewels and magical robes and beautiful trinkets and things yeah. I was like oh that's this is familiar good job <laughs> Sapkowski <laughs> just throw Geralt in there yeah make it interesting yeah I mean as a reader reads through the short stories especially it's definitely clear that as you said like Sapkowski for lack of a better word just like he mutates these fairy tales <laughs> um, into something that's still recognizable and vaguely familiar mm. but unexpected yeah but just like there's Geralt <laughs> what's he gonna do <laughs> he sticks himself in everybody's business <laughs> I know. like nobody's business and <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a sweet baby angel but so like no common sense when it comes to other people very good at his job zero common sense with other people <laughs> And, like, half the time I'm wondering if he, like, followed this lead of these, like, corpses of travelers on the road out of boredom, (laughs) or if he was like, oh, if it's a monster, then maybe I'll get some coin. Like, it's kind of hard to tell where he's going with it. Like, what are his motivations here? Is it just boredom? I don't know. (laughs) It seems like a really morbid, like, Hansel and Gretel way to, like, find friends. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, so we can dig into like the arrangement that he really creates with the fathers mm-hmm. rather with girls themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so he does mention that when these fathers bring their daughters, which happens quite frequently, I think there were at least like, there were probably like five or six girls we spent time with. They go through the same cyclical period of being really terrified of him and then enjoying his company. And then some of them engage with him, get into the sexy times with him, get a little freaky <laughs> with him. At, like in his beast form and he does mention he's like i ran in the mirror between breaks to see if anything had changed <laughs> like, good on you <laughs> you poor thing <laughs> and it didn't work uh which is why he at some point becomes a little jaded and a little um very much a realist with himself in a situation mm-hmm. it's so strange like he has this lovely little thing about consent in his story and when he talks about these women mm. he says like you know they were treated like princesses when they were here they only held a fan and didn't, weren't stooping over 
washing, that sort of thing. Yeah, I actually found that kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Just because you're sort of introduced to this character as sort of like, oh, he's a bumbling, cursed rapist, you know? <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> afterwards, like, he's a nice guy. Yeah. He raped somebody, but he's a nice guy. <laughs> it's so bad because I just had, like, that scene from Shrek pop into my head and it just in the background just time may change me but I can't change time <laughs> and that's like basically what happens with Novellan and I think it's part of the circumstance of a situation where he's like no longer this like miserable pushover and this uncertain person and then he just kind of grows into his beastly self you know for better or for worse question mark yeah I feel like Sapkowski and and you know the character of Novellan at, at that point are just sort of like you know how can I make up for this horrible thing I've done yeah well, like every other woman I meet I'll treat like royalty yeah I wonder if it's intentional repentance or if it's really just him not being within peer pressure or being alone and he kind of reverts back to some extent to who he was without this gang in his life like what does his authentic self look like yeah I guess that this is it question mark but I wonder like what these years have done to him mentally because he had that period where he was just miserable depressed and alone and then these few years with these women builds his confidence yes maybe maybe he found the light you know who knows <laughs> I feel like we were all kind of weird and dumb and awkward when we were preteens definitely um, which presumably Novellan when this happened is somewhere in his like pre-teens maybe mid-teens uh when this curse first happens you know, we're now 12 years on. So he's probably, I'd ballpark him maybe in his early to mid 20s at this point. Yeah. And like, I have to keep reminding myself, you know, especially talking about this particular story, this happened in a fantasy world, you know, (laughs) like, this isn't something that happened in the real world. And in fantasy world, justice is different. (laughs) (laughs) Also, there are bear people. (laughs) Yeah, then there's bear people. Yeah. I have to remind myself that the bear people aren't real people. <laughs> yeah, not real people. So it's, you know, maybe maybe he's a good guy now. <laughs> yeah, people change, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm significantly different <laughs> when I was like 13, 12. He definitely seems to have grown up a bit. Yes, as is inevitable for all of us. <laughs> Just like staring into the passage of time, watching it fly by. <laughs> mm-hmm. On his way out, Geralt asks Novellan about the girl outside the manor, saying that she's likely a monster herself. Novellan insists to Geralt that they love each other. As they speak, Novellan interacts with Roach, the witcher's horse, in the courtyard. Proud that animals like him, Geralt asks again if Novellan needs his help, and Novellan tentatively asks about lifting the curse, citing, quote, monster dreams he's been having. Just as he's about to leave, Novellan calls out to Geralt, asking if he came here following the tracks of a merchant who had been to the property recently. Geralt confirms that something happened to one of them, and Novellan reminds Geralt to leave the forest quickly for his safety and leaves the courtyard. Oh, that's ominous. <laughs> This is a very short part of this subpart, but it has a lot of information that is necessary later. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like all of the information that you get in this part is necessary later. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So before leaving, Geralt tells Novellan the church that they had raided was the Church of Quorum Agterra, the lion-headed spider. Again, we hear that this place is just like not great. Super bad juju, green flames, skulls and bones on the altar. Sick. (laughs) (laughs) That's dope. And yeah, so this is like a very specific temple that's like not really known for being (laughs) one of the friendlier ones. Idiots. They're like, let's go raid this one. It's got skulls and bones and green fire. So Novellan this whole time as he's been talking to Geralt has been telling him like, "Eh, I don't really want to lift it. I'm stronger this way. I'm not sick all the time as I was when I was human. I have more confidence in myself. My libido's great. Like all this other stuff. (laughs) And then in this moment of vulnerability, right before Geralt's about to leave he actually asks like is it possible to lift this he admits that he's been having these wild dreams and he just describes them as monstrous and we don't really get much but Geralt tells Novellan in this moment he's like yes you should be afraid as seemingly unimportant as this may seem (laughs) uh, Novellan's interaction with Roach he's like kind of patting the horse and the horse really likes him and Novellan says like animals like me my cat came back (laughs) he says like you know even though I'm in this monstrous form I get along with them Mm. the last little bit of information is the detail of what 
Geralt believes that girl is. Geralt tells Nivellen that that girl is probably Rasalka. If I'm remembering correctly, a Rasalka is a kind of, you know, female water creature or demon. So kind of like an OP nymph or something. Yeah, that kind of sounds like what it is. Like a messed up water nymph that just wants to see you dead. Yeah, there's a lot of women like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nivellen says that, you know, he suspected as much. She's like dark and like weird and speaks in a, some sort of odd language he can't understand. <laughs> but then he insists like we love each other. Cute, but also like how? <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, and also, like, why why wouldn't she take him as a victim? Like, that, I found that very interesting, too. Yeah, that's definitely one of the more interesting questions that comes up that's answered by the end of the chapter. In parts three and four, we see Geralt in these two small moments after he's left Nivellen's manor. Ignoring Nivellen's advice, Geralt spends the night in the forest, eventually coming across something which makes Roach nervous and fussy. The horse's demeanor reminds Geralt of Nivellen's words at their departure, animals like me. So at this point, Geralt has made some sort of connection that isn't totally clear for the reader just by reading these um, parts. He's definitely tuned in to what his horse is doing, <laughs> um, which makes a lot of sense to me, actually. Yeah. I used to work with horses a lot on a pretty regular basis. Uh, I used to ride them, used to take care of them. And I gotta say that they're definitely up there with some of the most psychic animals I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people know of the saying that like horses can smell fear. Um, or, you know, you can't be nervous when you're around them because they'll pick up on that and exploit it. Um, <laughs> it's ominous. <laughs> but no, they're, they're very, very psychically inclined animals, and they pick up on a lot of really subtle things that most people and, you know, most normal humans aren't aware of. Mm -hmm. And apparently, they're more sensitive to some things even than witchers, <laughs> uh, you know, except the poor horse doesn't have, like, a silver sword and, you know, crazy reflexes, so they, they just get scared about it. It also also probably doesn't help that Geralt's are just being rather dense this whole chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you've got the horse being like, um, ma'am, <laughs> something's not right. <laughs> and it takes so long for Geralt to actually listen. <laughs> like, could we, could we maybe not stay here? That would be great. Yeah. So the connection that Geralt makes here is that there's this little ring of mushrooms, which the narrator refers to as a devil's ring. These stupid little mushrooms make Roach scared. <laughs> Geralt is like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And he remembers how fussy she was at the beginning of the chapter when Geralt first encountered the girl in the woods and she didn't want to go toward the manor. Mm. And comparing her behavior in those two moments against what Novellan said about animals like me, it's clear to Geralt that Roach, in you know her animalistic instincts, has identified that Novellan is in her in her mind, you know, fine and non-threatening. But there's something weird about these goddamn mushrooms, and there's something really weird about that girl. And this is when Geralt finally realizes that, like, ah, uh, something might be wrong. <laughs> Way to go, Geralt. Yeah, it took you long enough but she got there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he had completely forgotten about like the mutilated people on the road until Novellan, you know, was like, yeah, maybe just don't come back here tonight. Right. Don't worry about it. Just head on out. <laughs> Go find the road. See you later. <laughs> I know Geralt was too busy trying to like play it cool and like <laughs> acting his way into Novellan's home. And then he's like, oh shit, that's right. That's why I was here <laughs> following the tracks of some dead people. Yeah, I don't know what he was doing. He's like, okay, bye. Oh, sweet, sweet baby. <laughs> <laughs> In part five, Geralt returns to Novellan's manor, his silver sword now on his back. The gate is wide open, and he is singing in the language he can't understand. The girl from the forest is now on the back of the dolphin in the middle of the dried fountain singing. Geralt confronts the girl and guesses that she's been attempting to enslave Novellan's mind so he'll blindly murder people for her, but also assumes that she hasn't succeeded yet. She reveals herself to be a Bruxa, a kind of vampire, and attacks the witcher turning into a giant black bat. In confronting her, Geralt says, you're so like a Rasalka that you can deceive anyone, but horses are never mistaken. They recognize creatures like you instinctively and perfectly. What are you? I think you're a mula or an alpor. An ordinary vampire couldn't come out in the sun. 
This scene is so funny because it's almost like this Scooby-Doo monologue where you're not getting it from the villain, but you're getting this huge monologue from the hero about, I think you're this. And she doesn't say anything because she's mute. He's like, are you this? She doesn't say anything. She just kind of shakes her head um, so she can understand him. It's just really funny. It's kind of like a weird like monster Jeopardy. Yeah, I, I feel like <laughs> a lot of the time while he's monologuing to her about like, are uh, you so-and-so? I think that he's actually just biding time. Yeah. So that he can like either get himself into a good position if there's a threat or like just try and um, figure out what she is by like getting a little bit closer to her. Yeah. Or just seeing if he can reason with her, you know, the same way he did with Novellan. Mm -hmm. Because of Roach mostly and I guess because of, you know, his you know seemingly dull witcher senses at this point that he's like oh <laughs> definitely something up here i actually haven't thought about this did he know that she would understand him or was he just kind of talking <laughs> like we do know that there are different kinds of monsters and classes of monsters in this universe and each of them have varying degrees of um sentience yeah they're just varying degrees of intelligence and sentience i'm curious to know if Geralt has been unable to identify exactly what she is if he's talking for the sake of talking or if he knows that she can understand him and i mean obviously she does like because she starts reacting and she starts nodding and shaking her head but was he just gonna talk at her if she didn't <laughs> I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe he was trying to, in a way, like, flatter her. Okay. By being like, ooh, you're so like this. Ooh, but you're not. <laughs> I, I sort of feel like he was trying to flatter her. Yeah. To make her, like, come out in her true form by listing all the things that she's not. Like, you're superior to all of these things. Interesting. That's an interesting perspective. But but what are you? Like, oh, what are you? You're superior. <laughs> all these other things are just inferior to you. You wouldn't like it if I called you a Rosalka, would you? <laughs> You know. So any man listening, if you need dating advice, <laughs> just lay it on thick. <laughs> just tell me everything that's inferior to me. <laughs> tell me how I'm superior. <laughs> oh, Lord. So you have a couple of details here about things that you've researched about Brooks's. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I was interested to figure out if a Brooksa was something from Polish mythology or from a different mythology, as Zabkowski is, you know, wont to do. He will just sort of grab different bits of fairy tales from all over the world. Mm -hmm. What I found out was that a Bruxa, although I don't know if it's pronounced Bruxa in its native language, but from what I understand, it originates in Portugal. Okay. And it may be pronounced Bruxa or Bruxa. Uh, a Bruxa is, in Portuguese mythology at least, is a female vampire, and they're normally transformed into a vampiric form via witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And according to their mythology and fairy tales, they leave home at night in the form of a bird, and their favorite activity is tormenting weary lost travelers. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, that fits nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Novellan does have a note that she likes birds, which then this is probably par for the course of what Sikovsky intended. Yeah, but I feel like lost travelers don't need any additional tormenting. Yeah, right? This just sounds like a terribly rude mosquito-like a vampire. <laughs> yeah, and well, it was interesting because at the very beginning of this story, Geralt wouldn't even have found the bodies in the road had he not noticed, you know, like scavenger birds. Yes. Um, and he just sort of like, oh, those birds look like they're interested in something morbid. Let's go that way. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting how it's sort of like he mentions her like of birds and throws birds into the story, I think, as a way to sort of reference the origins of this particular monster. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's just how I interpret it. Yeah. She's, she appears as a beautiful maiden, leaves a normal human life by day. Apparently Brooks's are able to bear children, but she eats her children as a regular form of food. Oh no. Um, <laughs> so there's that. And it's also said that she's impossible to kill. Uh, so that's also an interesting little tidbit. But yeah, that's, that's what I learned about, about the Brooks'a. Creepy. <laughs> yeah. Odd, but is eating your own children sustainable? Like, this <laughs> this seems, like, really inefficient. If a Bruxa has the same, you know, maternity cycle as a regular human, eating like that every nine months, that seems really inefficient. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree. Some crazy Kronos shit. It's definitely not unheard of for Mother Nature, though. I mean, it happens in nature all the time, but... This is true. Definitely not sustainable. No. This seems kind of short-sighted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
At this point, we see the Bruxa and Geralt engage in combat. She's fast and she's agile, and Geralt eventually lands a small cut no longer than a little finger on her chest. The Bruxa transforms back into her female form and through telepathy threatens to kill him. During the battle, Nivellen stumbles into the courtyard, bleeding and shouting for Verena as the vampire and witcher fight. As each of them struggle to gain the upper hand, Nivellen calls out to her, distracting her from the fight, and stabs her through the chest of the broken pole. The vampire pulls the pole deeper into her chest, bringing herself closer and closer to Nivellen, who still holds the shaft. She attempts to kill him, and the witcher instinctively runs toward the pair and with a forceful cut, beheads the Bruxa. Yeah, it's pretty gory. Yeah. I remember thinking the imagery of that was uh, particularly gnarly. (laughs) I quite liked it. I was like, oh, gross. It's oddly poetic. Oh, yeah. The way that she's described is like a white butterfly on a pin. And as she's pulling herself down this pole, this pole is erupting from her back along with her blood. The fight ends very suddenly. Mm. So Geralt and this Brookstar are going at it. And then Nivellen interjects himself into the fight. And then all of a sudden it's over. As she goes to kill him, she tells him, mine or nobody's, I love you. And then that's when she goes to like chomp on his neck and end it. So when Geralt cuts her head off right before she bites Nivellen's throat, Mm -hmm. when I was reading through it, I was just like, that's how the curse was supposed to end. Nivellen was supposed to die right there the hands of this Bruxa. She was supposed to rip his throat out. And Geralt was just like, nope. Whoop, and just like <laughs> cuts her head off. <laughs> just like, nope. Could you imagine that sound effect like in the Netflix series? <laughs> oh, every time he like makes a cut, whoop, whoop, shloop. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone. But it's just like, you ruined a perfectly good curse, man. That was supposed to be his punishment for rape. <laughs> Death by Bruxa. Like, you totally ruined it. I don't know if you intended it this way. If the curse itself and the details of the curse were about love and blood, saying that he would die at the hands of like a vampire, it, it would be actually a very interesting and poetic way to tile that up and an interesting interpretation of what blood means in the context of this curse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely how I interpreted it. Oh my god, all the layers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, she's like dragging herself along this pole, you know, pulling her bloody body down this splintering pole towards her lover and being like if i can't have you no one can and then ripping out his throat like that's that's exactly what that priest intended <laughs> <laughs> and Geralt's just like derp-a-derp. oh can't let that happen sorry this is not the time to be a hero <laughs> um <laughs> Geralt just always finds himself into the middle of everybody's business when he shouldn't <laughs> yeah i mean it's a complicated situation i'll give him that like it's complicated yeah at least in killing verena preventing any more weary travelers from from a horrible fate. Just leaves the TSA at it then. Yep. (laughs) American jokes. (laughs) America. It's crazy. (laughs) Oh, god damn it. After Geralt beheads the Bruxa, he approaches Nivellen, who has been transformed back into his human form. In his sobbing and laughing disbelief, Nivellen asks Geralt, why, after so many years, how is this possible? And Geralt responds, there's a grain of truth in every fairy tale, love and blood. They both possess a mighty power. Wizards and learned men have been racking their brains for years, but they haven't arrived at anything except that. That what, Geralt? It has to be true love. (laughs) <laughs> this is so cute <laughs> it's a surprising end to this i think given what readers know about the witcher as it's been written up until this point it's a surprisingly light-hearted end yeah it wraps it up in a nice little bow mm-hmm. <laughs> Geralt concludes the story with this concept of the power of love and blood. Presumably, he means Verena's love and blood is ultimately what broke Nivellen's curse. Because the curse is finally broken, you can assume that every person that Nivellen has encountered up until this point, regardless of, you know, their relationship with him, has never been true love. Which is interesting, and I think begs a lot of questions around, like, what was the nature of their relationship? Did they court each other in the traditional way? Like, how do you go about dating a vampire? Is Netflix and chill, like, still on the table? How- <laughs> <laughs> what, is the, what is the day-to-day like of being, like, a bear man and this vampire? Like, is she wandering around in pajamas eating cereal? Like, <laughs> like do they poop in front of each other? Like, these are the questions <laughs> that I have. Like, how real is this relationship? That's a really good question. I think it's interesting that they state that she really loves him. I I know they end the story with, you know, oh, it was true love. It has to be true love. 
but part of me just wonders if the curse was broken because he killed the Bruxa. Interesting, yeah. And, like, I feel like the Bruxa was, like, the embodiment of Novellan's curse. Although it's nice to think that, you know, Verena actually did love him. You know, her last words were, I love you, which is very sweet. <laughs> Barring the fact that she tried to kill him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she she was like, if I can't have you, nobody will, <laughs> and was going to rip his throat out. So what does a vampiric relationship look like? It's not a very healthy one. I mean, you can apply that term to a lot of relationships in the real world. Oh, absolutely. They may not be sucking your blood, but... Uh... <laughs> I think, I think on some level, you know, those of us that have been in the relationship game for a while, we know exactly what a vampiric relationship oh, looks yeah. like. <laughs> Womp. I, yeah, I suppose you can compare it to an abusive relationship where you have someone who is a victim and then you also have someone who has a need and a desire for control on, you know, so many levels in this specific scenario. You know, she wanted or needed Novellan to be a resource for her as she terrorized this forest and, this, and the town's nearby in in some like in some part of her soul like she really did love him otherwise the curse wouldn't have been broken at all but it's very much like i think like an inner perception as to how to define love yeah definitely there's a lot of different definitions of it and it's different for everybody depends on the situation (laughs) so now that we've wrapped up our discussion reading of a grain of truth Charlotte, what have you taken away from this short story? Well, before I criticize Novell and, and Geralt any more than I already have, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of it sort of comes down to don't judge a book by its cover. Mm-hmm. You know, that sort of saying, um, because Geralt, although he does seem monstrous to the outside world, isn't necessarily a monster. And, you know, one could say the same of Novell uh, It's just sort of like a circumstantial problem that uh, a lot of people don't bother to understand. Mm-hmm. So not making split second decisions and judging people right off the bat. Right. Um, it's just sort of like one of the little moral takeaways. You know, try to have some sympathy for the villain. Yeah. <laughs> But then there's the other part of me that's just like, well, <laughs> you can be a spineless young boy who who rapes a priestess and gets cursed, and one day a bored witcher can just come along and make everything okay, you know, just <laughs> totally by accident. You don't actually have to face the actual consequence, which uh. should have been a bruxa ripping your throat out on the end of a bloody spike. Like, that should have been your curse. But no, Novellin, you're a changed man. Uh. So, you know, and also trust your horse. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love Roach. Iconic. Absolutely iconic. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, Charlotte and I go behind the scenes of her shop, Bangerberg Glamour Eye. Hey, it's Lars from Witcher Flicks again. And this is Tidings from Toussaint. Every episode I'll give a nice little update about what is new for The Witcher show on Netflix. So let's jump right into it. The post-production is well on its way at the moment. This is good and bad for us fans. It's good because it means that The Witcher show's release date is coming closer and closer. But it's also bad because news are rare and sparse at the moment. So this installment of Tidings from Toussaint is a little bit shorter. Nevertheless, I can report on some interesting tidbits from the world of The Witcher show. Redanian Intelligence, a great and very dedicated fan page for news surrounding the show, did a report on the post schedule for each episode that was posted on Instagram by an unnamed member of the post-production team. Unfortunately, we can only see details about the first three episodes. We learn again that directors Alex Sakharov and Mark Jobst are in charge of the pilot episode. So episode 1 is in good hands, as we have two men who were directors for shows such as Game of Thrones, House of Cards, Black Sails, Marvel's Daredevil, Hannibal or Marco Polo. Director Alex Garcia Lopez was again confirmed for episode 3 of the show. Meanwhile, lots of actors are doing ADR recordings at the moment. ADR means Automated Dialogue Replacement. These sessions are for improving the overall audio quality by re-recording the dialogue that was recorded during filming. Henry Cavill already finished his sessions, as well as Adam Levy, who plays the Druid Mausag. Other actors who did ADR recordings include Jason Thorpe, who will be Lord Ostrid, one of King Faltest's courtiers from the short story The Witcher, Jeremy Crawford, 
who will play the draw of Yarpen Sigrin and Blair Kincaid as the Skelligan warrior and one of Princess Pavetta's suitors, Krug and Kraid. All of them teased us by saying that they were amazed by the final scenes they saw on screen. Well, this sounds really promising. In other news, Digital Spy, one of the biggest British-based entertainment, TV and movie websites, wrote an article about nine rising TV stars you need to watch out for in 2019. And rightly so, two of these nine spots were earned by our witch's own Freya Allen as Siri and Anya Shalotra as Yennefer. I think we can completely agree on the fact that even the short teaser trailer gave some promising hints at their acting skills. I have a feeling Anya, as well as Freya, will really surprise us with their interpretation of Yennefer and Siri. By the way, until today, the teaser trailer for The Witcher Show was watched more than 18.7 million times. It's now the sixth most watched video on Netflix's YouTube channel. It only needed about four weeks for this. This is definitely a great accomplishment. Anyway, guys, that's it for me for today. We'll talk again in the next episode of Breakfast in Beauclair. Until then, thanks again for listening and good luck on the path. Thank you so much for the update, Lars, and welcome back from the break. I'm here with Charlotte, and we just wrapped up our discussion on the second short story from Andrew Sikovsky's Last Wish, A Grain of Truth. So I want to take a moment to reintroduce Charlotte, who's the mastermind behind Bangerberg Glamorite, where she creates lore accurate witcher fragrances. So when you and I first spoke, Charlotte, you first introduced me to the process and the complexities of your business, and I thought it was absolutely fascinating to just learn about all these things from you, and I wanted to invite you on and make sure that we talked about your business and all of the cool things that you're doing. Well, thank you. Not a lot of people ask me this question, so I'm actually really excited. <laughs> I remember sitting on the phone with you. We had like a 20-30 minute phone call when I asked you if you wanted to be on the podcast. I remember, you know, 20 minutes of that 30 minute a call was just me like deeply engrossed in your process when it came to creating Vengerberg Glam Rye. Oh. And I was like, oh, I totally want to like hear this again and get it on record because it's so neat. Yeah. I, and I don't get to talk about it very much, um, especially not to any form of listening audience. So <laughs> looking forward to it. From what you said to me, you have previous experience in creating fragrances before founding Vengerberg Glam Rye. Could you tell us a little bit about the origin of that? And then when and how did you decide to combine your experience with perfumery with your love for the Witcher universe? Yeah, sure. As far as making perfumes goes and my personal history with it, I'd say about six years ago was when I first was exposed to the world of perfumery and, and making oils mainly. I actually used to work in a witch shop. <laughs> it, it was a shop that provides wares and supplies for like the Wiccan and pagan and, you know, witch community where I live. That's so fascinating. It, it was a Definitely an interesting experience. Um, <laughs> it's a learning experience for sure. I, I, I'm just going to preface this by saying that I, I don't practice, as they say. I'm not, you know, I don't call myself a witch. Uh, it's not a religion for me, but it is for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Paganism and Wicca, all these different forms of what, you know, most people would call witchcraft is, is a pretty old religion. Uh -huh. um, so basically it was like working in like the Christian bookstore, but like, <laughs> like for witches, oh. you know? <laughs> Man, I'm familiar with those. And, you know, Christian bookstores, they sell you books and they sell you like things you can hang on your wall and, you know, uh, all these little trinkets and things that like make you seem more Christian or more witchy. We sold tools to help people focus on whatever it was they were doing. Yeah. My main role at this shop was the oil production manager. So it was my job to make and create ritual oils. Okay. For the community. Um, and these were oils that were designed to help people focus on specific things. So we had like a money oil. If you were short on money or like working on a spell, the money oil is something that you could either wear on your person or use in your ritual work to help you focus your intention 
And what's interesting about perfume is that olfactory memory, so, so scent memory, is a very, very, very strong aspect of memory retention. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're going throughout your day and you want to make sure you're remembering to think about, oh, I got to get that money today. <laughs> All you got to do is just smell your wrist and boom, you're remembering. That's what money smells like. That's how I got my experience making oils and making perfume. Now, most of the perfumes I made for this business were from a very large book <laughs> and I was basically basically just following old recipes. And after a while, I started playing around and they let me have a little more freedom and they let me create my own oils to add into the collection that we were selling. And I had access to a vast fragrance library. Just imagine like multiple shelves of oils, essential oils, fragrance oils, uh, resins, herbs, you know, solid materials like bone fragments and beads and crystals and stuff. I had all this access to this stuff. Mm -hmm. As I was reading through the Witcher books, I also happened to be working at this shop. I started dabbling around with some of the oils I had access to, and uh, eventually... I purchased some of my own to work with at home, um, and that's kind of where I started. I got my training through this business, and then I used that training to create something new. So what was the moment where you decided to actually use the lore as an inspiration for a new venture? There's a really specific point in time in the books where I knew I wanted a particular fragrance. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think that most of the people that have read the books and played the games, they're all very familiar with Yennefer's fragrance, Lilac and Gooseberries. Yeah. (laughs) There's a whole song dedicated to it in the game, which is gorgeous. It's a big thing. When you read the books and you read the original content, you get a much broader picture of what Yennefer actually uses this fragrance for. Mm -hmm. And it's all encapsulated in this tiny little interaction in a passage in The Time of Contempt. Mm -hmm. Yennefer and Ciri are on their way to the city of Gosvelen, which is a city of sorceresses and a city of magic. They're on their horses. They stop at a hill overlooking the city. And before they enter through the city gates, Yennefer has to prep herself. Mm -hmm. So she sits on her horse, she arranges her hair over her forehead, and she takes out a small green glass jar from her saddlebags. Uh-huh. You know, throughout the story, you've been hearing about this, like, famous lilac and gooseberry scent, but you've never actually seen what it is she's using, or how she uses it. You just know she smells like that. Mm-hmm. But it's clearly something that's very specific. Um, so she pulls out this green glass jar, and she uncorks the jar, which gives off the scent of lilac and gooseberry. And it was at this moment that I was like, oh my god, that's the stuff. Uh (laughs) That's the stuff she's using. That's what's making her smell like that. Yeah. Like, what the hell is that? And, you know, (laughs) it goes on to describe, like, oh, she sticks her finger in this jar, and she rubs a little of it under her eyes, and she, like, rubs it on her face, and she, like, puts it on, like, a perfume. Uh And then she turns back to Siri, and Siri is looking at her, and Yennefer just looks like a completely different person. Like, she looks like a goddess. Her eyes are glowing with violet light. Her face is radiating with beauty. She looks provocative. She looks dangerous and unnatural. Uh And Siri is sitting there with her like mouth open because (laughs) of Yennefer's beauty. And she's like, the little green jar. What was in it? <laughs> and, and like, and I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, what was in it? I, what, what, was, what is that stuff? And this is where we find out what it is. And Yennefer is just like, it's glamorai. Mm-hmm. It's an elixir, or rather a cream for special occasions. What was interesting about this to me um, was that clearly it's something that sorceresses use right. for quote unquote special occasions. Mm-hmm. But the special occasion in this case was actually really interesting. It wasn't just so that she'd look pretty for going into the city. Mm-hmm. In the books, the author goes on to explain, and Yennefer goes on to explain, that she's using it to distract people from looking at Siri. Right. Because Siri is the most important thing. Siri is the thing she's trying to conceal here. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, you know, Siri's like, I want to use some. I want to use some of that. I want to be pretty. And Yennefer is just like, no, you are to be invisible and I am to be your camo. They ride up to the gate and nobody even sees Siri because everyone is so transfixed by this like glowing goddess who's like wafting lilac and gooseberry all over everybody. And just like, she just walks right through the gate. Yeah. The guards try to stop her. And she's like, oh, what? What? <laughs> and she's like, wasps perfume over near them. And they're like, oh, you go 
go right ahead, beautiful lady. And they just like <laughs> waltz right in, no problem. So it was at this point that I'm like, I gotta have some of that. <laughs> I want some of that. Like, I need to, I need to find this thing if it exists. Yeah. And how did that search go? Well, I went online, of course, <laughs> as one does. The Googles. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, let's Google it. Let's see, let's see if I can find some of this glamorize uh-huh. and let's see if someone's making it. Because like, if they're making it, I'm gonna throw my money at them because I want it. I want to smell like that. And I couldn't really find anything. Mm -hmm. There are definitely some other companies, you know, making witcher inspired fragrances and perfumes. Right. But none of them were as it was described in the book, you know, because it's described very specifically. I didn't want a a liquid perfume. Mm -hmm. I didn't want like a bar soap or anything like that. So I was like, if it doesn't exist already, then I'll just make one. Ugh. Just make it for myself. I love it. <laughs> That's pretty much how how I started that first fragrance. I was just making it for myself. Yeah. And it took me about a year. Which is wild. Yeah, it took me a long time. Lots and lots of trial and error. And, and I was just making Yennefer's at this point. Mm-hmm. That was really all I was focused on. It was just this lilac and gooseberry cream. Yeah. And you told me a little bit about why it takes this process so long, too. Would you be able to tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. So working with fragrances is interesting and difficult and really frustrating Uh because after a while, if you've been working with a fragrance for a long time, you can't smell it anymore. Right. Your your nose just kind of gets overwhelmed. There are ways that you can mitigate this effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people use coffee beans or ground coffee to kind of clear out your nose. It's kind of like a olfactory palate cleanser Uh to just like snort some coffee and just like get it up in there. (laughs) And then it sort of like clears everything else out. But after a while, even the coffee stops working. Right. You can't even smell the coffee anymore. So fascinating. Yes. Yeah, so, so you have to give your fragrances time away from you. Yeah. I, I'd have a ratio of fragrances. I'd have a trial cream, you know, put together and it would smell really good to me that day. Mm-hmm. And then I would close it up, put it away. And I have to wait like three to four days before I come back to it, open it and smell it again. Right. It, it has to be like I'm smelling it for the first time every time I open it because that's how my customers are going to smell it. Uh It's difficult to pace it out. So there were many, many, many trials and many errors and many failures. (laughs) I'll put it that way. Uh, I wasted a lot of supplies trying to make Yennefer's. With the help of my friends who have been indispensable because they're extra noses, right? They're not working with fragrance all day. Uh, My poor friends, anyone that would come over to my house, they'd be like, hey, (laughs) Hey, smell this thing and like stick it in their face and be like, what do you think about that? Uh, just fragrance pushing. Yeah, no, seriously. Anyone who comes over to my house, I'm like, hey, you want to smell this thing I got? Like, I have my own weird little fragrance library in my kitchen. Like, I, I hope you guys all know, I make all of these out of my kitchen. We like, love a home cook. <laughs> like, I make it out of my kitchen. I have a tiny little table and like some shelves. But yeah, it, ta- it takes a long time and it takes a lot of trial and error. Mm-hmm. The first time you told me about it, I remember sitting in the phone booth at work just with this huge grin on my face, being completely in awe of the amount of, you know, effort and behind the scenes work that goes into making something that, you know, I can absolutely attest to is so specific to the lore and it is absolutely spot on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, when I reached out to Charlotte, asked her what she would recommend from her product line, she has four things and I I bought three of them. (laughs) And when they got delivered, they were just so beautifully packaged. Like everything had been so thought through and considered from the branding that had been done and the way that it had been put together in you get this beautiful wax sealed glass jar and this leather holding pouch. I was so excited to get it. And I like ran upstairs with my little box of Angerberg Glamour Eye. (laughs) And, you know, I just sat there for the longest time, just uncorking them, smelling them, recorking them, uncorking (laughs) them, smelling them, and recorking them. Before I read the books, Mm. I had no idea what a gooseberry was. Like, I live live in New York. I have no idea what a gooseberry is. (laughs) It wasn't until, you know, I started making content of my own and like I like Googled them and they just look like really funny grapes. They look like veiny. veiny grapes. They look like if a grape tried to camouflage itself as a watermelon, that's what a gooseberry (laughs) looks like to me. 
obviously you hear the phrase lilac and gooseberries everywhere in the Wisher universe. Mm -hmm. I just find them so beautiful. And I think that you absolutely nailed it with Yennefer's. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You've since expanded your product line as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, Yennefer isn't the only sorceress that Geralt goes around sniffing. That's for sure. (laughs) Definitely comes into contact with a lot of other fragrant ladies. What an oddball. (sighs) Oh, yeah. So another one that I really wanted to make was Philippa. Mm-hmm. You know, who's sort of like a lesser known character, I guess. You know, she's referenced in a couple of the games. Her her character design in the games I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. But, you know, she plays kind of a larger role in the book series. Mm-hmm. At one point, Geralt is in very close proximity to Philippa. Uh-huh. He actually gets to smell her perfume. Mm-hmm. During this period of time, he's actually blindfolded. <laughs> So he's actually relying very heavily on his other witcher sense to sort of give him an idea of what's going on. He recognizes Philippa entering the room based on what her perfume smells like. This is another one where, like, you know, you said you'd never heard of a gooseberry before. You didn't know what it was. Philippa is described as smelling like cinnamon, musk root, and baking powder. I didn't add the baking powder in. That doesn't really smell like anything. I think that's just to illustrate how keen his sense of smell is. Yeah. But I didn't know what musk root was. I was like, what the hell is that? I don't even know what that is. I had to like do so much research. It has several different names. Uh It's an oil that actually exists in real life. For example, lilacs don't distill well Uh into like a natural essential oil. Okay. Lilac essential oil is not something that exists. Huh. You can maybe do a distillation of lilacs, which is sort of, you know, it's like a floral water, mm-hmm. but it's very ephemeral. It doesn't last long. It's a very delicate compound, and it's extremely expensive and difficult to make. There are some fragrances that don't exist naturally that are referenced in the Witcher series. Right. I, I do have a lot of people ask me, you know, do you only use natural oils in your product? And, you know, unfortunately, the answer is no, but I use a mixture of both natural oils and fragrance oils. Mm -hmm. Essential oils are natural. Fragrance oils are not. They're synthesized. Oh, that's interesting. I I wouldn't have known that. So both lilac and gooseberry are fragrances that don't exist naturally, Hmm. but cinnamon and muskroot are both natural essential oils. And muskroot is a variety of valerian. It's a type of Himalayan valerian that only grows, I think, in China and Nepal and India. Uh-huh. Although when I did when I did some other research, I think it, it sometimes grows in North America too at like higher altitudes. Right. Uh, but it's a it's a very interesting and very expensive oil. It has a long history behind it. It was used in biblical times to like anoint Jesus's feet or something. Dope. <laughs> don't don't quote me on that. But it, it goes by a lot of different names. It goes by muskroot, bicanard, nardin. It goes by nard. Lots of different names for this oil. Mm -hmm. Just in that, I was really hyped to work on Philippa's. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I got some essential oils. These things actually exist. And they're like crazy. They're really interesting. Uh So yeah, I made one for Philippa. Some other ones that are out of the book were uh, Lydda. She smells of, you know, freesia and apricot. Mm -hmm. Triss was kind of more of a fan pleaser. (laughs) I hate to say it, but it's true. Because oddly (laughs) enough, despite the fact that Geralt gets real cozy with Triss, there's no description of what she smells like. I was disappointed. I was like, what? what is this? I mean, Geralt's relationship with Triss, you never see it in the books. It's referenced to very, very, very briefly in a couple of passing lines, almost in snide remarks from different characters that, yes, it happened, but it was definitely something that I think bloomed into its own in the world that CD Projekt Red created. Oh yeah, definitely. I think that actually may have been intentional on the author's part. I mean, Geralt clearly doesn't feel the same way. He doesn't feel the same way at all. Right. And in the books, right. Triss is just like all over him <laughs> and he's just like, no... <laughs> Not really into it right now. <laughs> so maybe he just didn't care what she smelled like. Maybe he just didn't smell her. I don't know. But, you know, Triss, the, the strawberry and rose, it's just kind of a sweet sort of cloying fragrance. It's nice, it's fruity, it's floral. You know, it's kind of a youthful fragrance. Yeah. It doesn't smell like candy or anything, which is something that I was really trying to veer away from. Yeah. I mean, that's the only one that, like, I personally don't have. I got Yennefer's, Philippa's, and Lydda's. 
the one that I use the most really is Yennefer's. I That's the one that I go to every time. And then I find <laughs> Lita's to be like, when I first smelled it, I remember out of the recesses of my brain just being like, this smells like summer. <laughs> I think I got these delivered sometime in the middle of winter. And I was just fantasizing like, this will be my summer scent. <laughs> yeah, to me, it just reminds me of like eating apricots outside. I, I really like the way that one turned out. It definitely made my mouth water. <laughs> <laughs> Subkovsky does this thing where he's just like with his female character is he's like all right fruit and a flower okay you you're a fruit and also a flower i guess that's all the rage in the witcher world right now is for women to smell like fruits and flowers as i was thinking of a name for the podcast i was researching every single in that is mentioned in the books and every single one it's an adjective and an animal an adjective and an animal <laughs> and i'm like if you i guess if you have a formula you just stick to it <laughs> yeah i guess so like philippa was the only deviation hers is actually one of my personal favorites mm-hmm. i love yennefer's as well i mean i wore yennefer's as my own fragrance before i started selling it right i had my little jar had my own personal little jar it was just mine and it was all for me <laughs> that was the one i actually wore the most It was funny because when I was wearing it before I decided to offer it to other people, Uh people were commenting on it. Like strangers? Yeah, just random people. My partner was trying to get me to sell it after I had made it. Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I can handle that or, you know, whatever, whatever I was saying at the time. Yeah. We were visiting my family in New Jersey and we were sitting on this on this shuttle bus from the train station. It was just me, my partner, and these two little old women. I had just put on a little bit of the lilac and gooseberry cream, just a little bit on my wrists. And this little old lady in the front of the bus turns to her friend and just says, like, very loudly, I smell lilacs. <laughs> just, like, very loudly, like, very specifically. And, and she was like, it's the middle of winter. There's no lilacs blooming around here. Where is that coming from? And, like, my partner is, like, looking at me like really pointedly and like elbowing me and be like hey say that it's you come on say that it's you oh I love that and I was like oh I don't know I'm too shy and so he's like it's her he like points at me she's the one that smells like lilacs and so these little old women like you know totter to the back of the bus like while the bus is moving (laughs) she comes up to me and she's like what is that I need to know what that is and so I pull out you know my little green jar with my like crappy little wax seal on it and she just looks me dead in the face and she's like you should sell that (laughs) and I was like okay thanks little old lady she was like no really and I was like okie dokie then (laughs) like and, you know, some time goes by. I come back to North Carolina. Um, I'm working three or four jobs at the time. Um, I was working at the witch shop. I was working at a sushi bar. And I was a zipline guide. So I was, you know, oh, taking whoa. people on canopy <laughs> tours through the trees. I was just trying to make as much money as possible, just hustling, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm working at the sushi bar. I like to wear this fragrance every now and then um, when I'm working because, you know, I don't want to smell like dishwater all the time. I, I put this perfume on at the end of my shift and I walk past the sushi chefs at the bar. Mm -hmm. One of the sushi chefs comes up to me and he's like, I've been smelling this fragrance throughout the restaurant all night and I can't figure out what it is. Are you wearing some kind of perfume? And I was like, uh, yeah. And he was like, what is it? And so I like pull it out of my purse and I show it to him. And he opens it up and he smells it. And this is a person that has no knowledge of The Witcher. They don't know anything about it. They don't care what it's based on or where it's from or anything. Mm-hmm. And this guy was like, how much do you want for it? And I was just like, uh. And I didn't even have like another bottle. I just had my own. Yeah. I was like, well, I'd have to buy another bottle and, you know, mix one up for it. He's like, how much do you want for it? I want it for my wife for our wedding anniversary. Oh, that's so sweet. I know. And I was like, whoa. (laughs) And at the time, you know, I I didn't have any packaging or really any idea of what I wanted to sell it for. Yeah. That was my first sale right there. (laughs) That's such a good story. (laughs) And you probably made love happen that night. I, uh, oh yeah, definitely. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They they got, they got down with it probably. (laughs) You know what that glamour does. (laughs) So coming out of your first sale, 
how did you scale your business into what it is today? Like, what was the reception when you started shopping around your product and building this little Vengerberg Glamorai empire from the ground up? <laughs> when I realized that other people might actually want it, it sort of dawned on me that there were other Witcher fans out there. Oh shit, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had to deal with a lot of coaxing from my partner, from my friends, because I was really nervous about it. Yeah. You put yourself out there, you open yourself up to a lot of criticism, to failure, and it's a risk. Certainly, I had to invest a lot of time and a good bit of money yeah. for me to invest in expanding my business was kind of scary. So I realized I was going to have to scale up mm -hmm. if I wanted to put it online and really get it out there. So right. yeah, how I was going to package it, how I was going to source all the materials for everything, um, how much that was going to cost me and like if it was going to balance out. And I wanted a lot of detail to go into the packaging. Uh -huh. So I, I wanted the fragrance to be something that was high quality and something that people wanted to wear. But I also wanted the packaging to be aesthetically pleasing, mm -hmm. accurate to the books. It says a little green jar and this is how it has to be packaged. I was very particular about it. Right. And it said that it was stored in, in Yennefer's saddlebag. So I was like, all right, well, saddlebags are typically made out of leather. Uh huh. You know, wouldn't it be nice to pull this little fantasy product out of a little leather bag? I wanted the whole thing to look like, you know, that it wouldn't look out of place in the Witcher universe at all. Mm -hmm. That's where the idea of for like the little leather pouch came in yeah in addition to sort of protecting it and like keeping it safe during the shipping process so I had to figure out how I was going to do that you know I, I don't have leather working tools and working with leather is time consuming and expensive so I actually sourced my little leather bags from another Etsy seller uh -huh. it's a pretty small time business and their shop name is Geppetto's Hands on Etsy mm -hmm. they're the ones that make uh, the little leather pouches and they use recycled leather like bits and scraps of leather and recycle them into the bag so they're not like sourcing it. Right. It's high quality leather for the most part and they have really good consistency with their product. Mm -hmm. Scaling up the business, it was intimidating. <laughs> It was quite a lot of money and time and mental strain. But with the help of my partner and of my friends and my family, yeah. I was able to do it. They were all really supportive. So uh, my partner helped uh, design my logo, which I'm really happy about. Which is so beautiful. Like, And I think it captures all the symbolism of what Vengerberg Glam Rye could and should stand for so beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. I really like it. It's a variation on a Pennsylvania hex sign, kind of a, an old school design that I've sort of revamped stuck a little pentagram in there. Unicorns. <laughs> yeah, the, there's unicorns in there. And of course, the unicorn, right? Like anybody who has read the books or played the games knows how Yennefer feels about her unicorns. <laughs> her singular unicorn. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like it fits right in there. I was very pleased with how everything turned out. Yeah. My first few sales online received really positive feedback. So I was like, all right, I must be doing something right. And you absolutely are. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. They're so beautiful and so specific to the lore. You know, every time I open it up, I'm like, one, it just smells beautiful. Even if you're not familiar with the lore, they're just beautiful scents, like flat out. If you are familiar with the lore, they just add on this wonderful real world element and you've put so much thought and detail into how these things are made and and I'm like oh you're right like they did come from saddlebags and like of course you put them in a leather pouch because of course that's how specific you can get with the lore <laughs> like you've done such a wonderful job of bringing these very abstract descriptions of people and insight into the Witcher universe out into our own worlds and I just think it's absolutely incredible thank you so much uh, I love it so before Charlotte and I sat down to record, I reached out to our Good Morning community to ask if they had any questions for her. First off, how would you recommend people use these fragrances? This is a cream perfume. It's a highly scented cream or lotion. I wouldn't recommend using it like you would a regular body lotion. Right. I wouldn't use it as a moisturizer per se because it is highly, highly, highly fragranced. So the way I'd recommend implementing it in your day-to-day -day routine would be to use it sort of in the same way you would use an oil perfume. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, you take a little bit of it onto your finger um, and you can dab it on areas of your body that are naturally quite warm. So typically with perfumes, you apply them to your pulse points. Uh-huh. 
Um, so areas where your skin is quite thin uh, and where it's naturally very warm. So the inside of the wrists, um, the inside of the elbows, either side of your neck, um, sort of where your arteries are, kind of underneath your jawline. Or you can apply it in little dabs to the back of your knees. Oh, that's interesting. And that's sort of traditionally where, where people will apply oil perfumes. If you find that it's not strong enough, you can always just apply more of it. Do be aware um, that, as I was saying before, when you smell a fragrance for a period of time, Time, you're gonna get used to it. Uh-huh. <laughs> It'll fade for you. But people around you, they should still be able to smell it on you. Yeah. You may not need to like continually reapply it as often as you originally think. Test it out on your friends. I've had customers tell me that, you know, they've applied a small amount and it has lasted, you know, upwards of six hours. Oh wow. Which is crazy to me because like the longest I've had it last on me personally is maybe about four or five hours before I felt, you know, the need to reapply or before I asked my friends, you know, hey, can you still smell this? Mm -hmm. I would just kind of experiment with where you place it on your body and how much you use. And also your, your body chemistry can affect how long the fragrance lasts and how it smells. Interesting. So just keep that in mind, like the natural oils on your skin and your natural fragrance like alters the way fragrances smell. Hmm. Yeah, I did have a customer say that it faded very quickly on her and it, or the, the fragrance was altered in some way when they put it on. And unfortunately, that's just kind of par for the course with perfume. I don't recommend rubbing it. I would just sort of dab it and pat it into your skin. Whoops. Um, <laughs> well, well, I mean, you can if you want to. You can rub it if you want to. I mean, I'm learning right now, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so rubbing perfume of any kind, not just cream perfume, but oil or sprays, perfume is designed to interact with the heat of your skin. If you rub a perfume into your skin, what you're doing is you're breaking down the fragrance molecules much more quickly, and you're actually heating it up to a point that's much warmer than your natural body heat. It can alter the fragrance to rub it into your skin as well. I would recommend just dabbing it on and patting it into your skin and just putting it on those warm areas of your body. A long answer, but... No, that's that's really <laughs> detailed and really helpful for people like me who just slather it on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. I mean, you do you. You know, you do you. Whatever works. I'm for sure guilty of just being like, eh, I'll just put a little bit on my wrists and then it journeys up to my face and up to my like collarbones and then like, oh God, it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, I've, I've definitely slathered it on myself too. And I'm <laughs> definitely guilty of having like rubbed other perfumes, like roll-ons, like rubbing my wrists together. Like, oh yeah, you know, yeah. just like trying to get it warmer for some reason. <laughs> but as I was learning more and more about perfumery and like the chemistry that goes into it, that's one of the things I learned. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. It's like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we got a question from one of our followers, Jackie Tacky. Will there be more fragrances inspired by other characters in the future? The answer is yes, definitely. <laughs> Like I was saying, Geralt gets that nose into quite a lot of ladies and <laughs> snips a lot of different people throughout the book series. I'm mainly trying to focus on scents that are described in the books. Right. The next one that I've been working on, I'm just going to apologize in advance to everybody who's been waiting for it. <laughs> it's been like a year and some months since I started working on it. But it's fine because now our listeners are educated on why it takes so long to come for the perfume, so everyone is very un- understanding of the work that's been going into this. <laughs> I, I hope so. Thank you all very much for your patience and understanding. <laughs> the next one that I have lined up to release is Siri. Her fragrance is only described once in the books, mm -hmm. and it is actually when she's a very small child and when she first meets Geralt mm -hmm. in Brokilon. This is one that stumped me because I was like, how am I going to make a lore accurate perfume that smells like this? It's kind of a complicated one. Yeah. In the books, she's described as smelling to him uh, like a damp swallow. So like a wet bird. Uh, so I'll just leave you guys to ponder on that one. But I'm almost done developing it. I'm pretty happy with what I've got right now. Well, I'm really excited. and I'm sure everyone will be really excited to try it out when it releases. If you want to smell like a wet bird, you know who to call. <laughs> Are there any other characters other than Siri? Yes. Siri's the only one I'm actively working on right now. But once I get hers out and in the shop, I have a few others lined up. Uh, Fringilla Vigo, Essie Davin, uh, Little Eye. And then there's another character who's very, very, very minor um, named Tiziana. I've had some requests for uh, Margarita Los Antilla. 
Although I I have no memory of her being described. I feel like she would just smell strongly of wine and sauna. Yeah, <laughs> like I could work with that. If it's requested and, and there's enough requests for it, then it, it may be worth it to go outside of the ones that are described. But for now, that's what I got in the pipeline. It's incredible to see how you not only capture the scent, but also the essence of the character, like this abstract personality into this very tangible object that we can then enjoy. It's really wonderful and really exciting. The next question that we had came from Cyprian, and Cyprian is going to be our guest for the next two episodes, episode three and episode four, covering the lesser evil and a question of price. And his question is if you have any plans on making a men's line. This is actually a question I've gotten before. I want to do this. I kind of want to get all the ones that I have in my mind out into the shop before I sort of venture in complete creative freedom where I'm just kind of making stuff up. And that's kind of where the men's fragrances live right now. It's just like the <laughs> make it up realm. Okay, if I wanted to go like real accurate, <laughs> like real <laughs> accurate, like a Geralt fragrance. I don't know. Do you really want to smell like blood and just dirty witcher sweat? <laughs> yeah, I mean like roach, you know, <laughs> you want to smell like a dirty horse. Anytime Geralt's fragrance is described, that's what it is. It's like, oh, you reek of the blood of men and elves and monsters. You're right. There's this quote from Yen, and I believe it's from one of the short stories, and it just came into mind, so apologies if it's incorrect. I I remember her telling Geralt he needs to bathe. Judging from the smell, she can tell the color and breed of his horse. Yeah. And like, that's not cute. <laughs> You're not getting any loving from that. <laughs> I mean, like, I understand the question of the men's line. I have a few fragrances in my library that lend themselves well to masculine fragrances. Despite the fact that these fragrances are based on female characters, to me, fragrance in general isn't really gendered. Yeah, for sure. Philippa's is definitely one that's quote unquote more unisex. Mm -hmm. If you didn't really want to smell like a fruit and a flower, you know, <laughs> I mean, like if a guy came up to me smelling like lilacs and gooseberries, I'd be like, wow, <laughs> you smell good. <laughs> but on that note, I've got some fun stuff I've been playing with. Birch tar. It's extremely difficult to work with, huh. but... It smells like a campfire. Ooh, that's interesting. So yes, Cyprian, uh, yes, at some point, <laughs> but not right now. Uh, try wearing uh, Yennefer's. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> So we had one last question that came in through Instagram and a bunch of people were asking about batch sizes. What do you think about larger or smaller versions of your Vancouver Glamour? So I've had the question of sample sizes asked pretty often. Most perfume makers sell like little vials of their perfume so that people can test it out before purchasing the whole thing, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> sense. Ha ha ha. <laughs> 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 oh, you caught that one and then I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously a good idea if you have a liquid perfume, but I have a cream perfume and I have run into several problems with trying to package this in smaller amounts while retaining like the product's integrity and quality. I actually tried to do sample sizes for a minute there. I got these like tiny little plastic jars and I was just putting in any sort of extra cream that was left over from the making process. Mm -hmm. But it turns out when you have a cream in such a small amount in a little plastic container that is not absolutely airtight, yeah. um, the cream congeals and it solidifies. This worked for a little while, but it wasn't something that was sustainable. Once it gets to you in a small size like that, it's not going to smell or feel or look the same. If anybody has any suggestions for how I could possibly do a sample of a cream. Ooh, well, that is a good task for our community, for sure. And larger sizes, the ratios that I have worked out for the perfume is for a very specific size of container. And I can scale this up, but I would have to purchase an entirely different form of packaging um, to make that happen. And honestly, I haven't had enough requests to make it feasible. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to be able to share with people like your future plans for Bangabur Glamourai, as well as to go behind the scenes of everything that goes into making such a wonderful product. What's next? You know, I'm really hyped about the Netflix series. 
And honestly, I'm just excited that an entire new demographic of people is going to be introduced to this story. And they're going to read the books, too. I'm really excited to see our communities grow. I think both of us wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't have a genuine love for the original content um, and for the world and for the lore. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen when the Netflix series comes out and, you know, the kind of people that it attracts and the possibility of bringing the Witcher universe into kind of like greater conversation into pop culture. Like I'm getting like chills thinking about it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a thing for sure. I'm like, how do I get my little jar on that show though? (laughs) Anya. So Anya, darling, if you're listening. (laughs) Let Charlotte know. (laughs) Yeah, let me know a complimentary (laughs) jar on (laughs) you. So that's it for our show today. Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation and for this episode. And thank you to our community for listening. Before we let you go, where can people find you? And is there anything that our little international Hansa can help you with? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this little podcast. Uh, I've been really excited about it and I've been trying really hard not to tell everybody I know about it because I didn't want to spoil <laughs> anything. Yeah, thanks to the community. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't even have a business. Um, and you guys can find me on Instagram, Vangerberg Glamorai on Instagram. Um, I also have a little website. The website has nicer pictures of my products than Etsy does. And it also has better descriptions. It has information on how to store your products and how to make it last longer. Um, So my website is just (laughs) Glamorai.com. Which is a huge power move. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I did that early on. (laughs) I was like, I'm just going to be taking that right there. (laughs) Glamorai.com. That's mine. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, if you guys have any suggestions, you know, I love getting feedback from people. All the feedback I've gotten so far has been so positive and so supportive. Thank you all so, so much for your support of my tiny, tiny, tiny little business. It means so much to me. Thank you. Oh, I love it. Uh, I feel like while I'm like bubbling up with like good feels, <laughs> Charlotte has been so wonderful and so patient and so supportive with me. <laughs> like, but, you know, really early on when I first started Good Morning, you know, back when I was like a month in, I don't even know if you found me or if I found you, but we started sharing each other's work. And then you just had so much patience with me as I've been pulling together this podcast. <laughs> I will slide into Charlotte's DMs at like one in the morning being like, hey, uh, what do you think of this podcast name? <laughs> <laughs> And you've just been so integral, just just like a wonderful sounding board as I've been kind of taking this idea from my own head and actually bringing it to life. And I'm really glad that we're kind of creating this wonderful little network of which are content creators and it makes me so happy and fuzzy inside. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Your content is some top grade stuff. I mean, (laughs) if anybody listening isn't already following you, they really should because I love your Instagram. It's phenomenal. (laughs) Uh, I repost stuff from there all the time. Just like, hey, you guys should go follow her. She's amazing. (laughs) Uh, it's such a wonderful community and I have like I feel really grateful to be a part of it and to have found you through it thank you for joining me and thank you to everyone for listening so next episode we're gonna hop over to Berlin for a chat with our friend Cyprian to learn how Geralt earned the nickname the Butcher of Blaviken in the short story The Lesser Evil ooh <laughs> Thanks for joining us at Breakfast Table. For show notes, transcripts of each episode, and a complete list of our social platforms and listening services, head over to breakfastinbeauclair.com. Breakfast in Beauclair is created by Alyssa from Good Morn. It's hosted by Alyssa with the Tidings from Dusant news segment by Lars from Witcherflix. The show is created by Alyssa with audio production by Mojo Filter Media. Breakfast in Beauclair theme by Mojo Filter Media and the Tidings from Dusant theme by Bettina Campamanas. Breakfast in Beauclair is produced by Alyssa in New York City. Special thanks to Charlotte from Vengerberg Glamry for joining us for this episode and our international hot for their support. Remember, as part of the Breakfast in Beauclair International Hansa, receive an exclusive discount on your next purchase of Glamorai. Use code Hansa for 10% off your purchase at Vengerberg Glamorai through the end of September 2019. Visit Glamorai.com or find Vengerberg Glamorai on Etsy to make your purchase.